You know who else could have used keeps a long time ago? Shawn Michaels. Boy, oh boy, he looks like a whole different person, doesn't he? Did you even get a chance to watch the biography yet? I know you've had so much yes. to watch on TV the last day or so. Well, I actually I watched the biography live because I don't want to. F- if you watch a WWE pay per view live, then you spend forty five minutes of the show on entrances. So, but you can't fast forward entrances in the biography specials. But no, I watched that as it aired, uh, and as as predicted. If you're still alive, you come out looking a whole lot better than if you're not. Because so far, the only subject that is not still around was Randy Savage, and that was the one that was uncomplimentary and all over the place. This one, it it makes me wish I'd have given Shawn Michaels another chance from being a fucking complete prick all those <laughs> years ago, right? <laughs> That's what I wondered. Watching As soon as it started, I said, I wonder if Jim sees this and says, you know, he really does seem like a different guy. And I did. And I said, and you, then I said, and you know what? If he hadn't been such a massive asshole before now, I'd have probably loved the guy. Um, he was a great wrestler. We've always said that a great performer and a great wrestler. And he got the fucking wrestling business. He was just uh, as much of this indicated a complete asshole and an unreliable prick. Um, but as I said, the way they painted him in such a good light by the end of it, I always I almost wished that I was somebody that would give people second chances. Um, <laughs> I, I, and I, I, I identified with him as an obsessive teenage wrestling fan. I'm the, but did you notice there was more pictures of him with color as a fan than there was when he actually got in a wrestling business? <laughs> He, every picture of Shawn Michaels as a teenager pretending to be a wrestler, he's covered with blood. And, and point to me the time in his career once he got into business and became a star that you ever saw him bleed. Uh, so he, he got rid of that fucking early uh, obsession. But you can you can tell guys that are good that are naturals and that are going to be even better than they are already you can tell the guys that can see it in their head. They, he watched wrestling. He saw it. And this is another one. Remember we said last week, Booker was 30 minutes into his story before he even took a wrestling lesson. Five minutes into this show, he'd Shawn Michaels had seen Southwest championship wrestling and he was hooked. And going to wrestling school, you know, you can see that he, he saw it in his head. He knew what this shit was supposed to look like. And I just looked up before we went on the air. Um, the date of the match I was thinking about, he maybe started training in 83, but it was 84 when he first really started wrestling in front of people. And, and they mentioned that, uh, after he trained in San Antonio with Jose Lothario, that he got booked out to mid South wrestling. And we had one of his matches on that, I guess he was there. It was in November of 84. So we were leaving. He was probably there for a couple months and then he did some jobs in Dallas because they, they kind of juxtaposed or interspersed the mid South and Dallas footage as if it was all mid South wrestling. One, there was even one graphic. He's in the ring at the sportatorium and it said mid South wrestling. Yeah. That's the one. There's no one there who knows the difference. That's the sad part. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't think they cared. It's little things, but, uh, but anyway, so he was only there for a couple of you know months at each place, just doing jobs, just to get experience. And then he finally got the spot in Kansas City. But I remember the match specifically we had with Shawn Michaels in Baton Rouge. And I know a lot of people now would go, "Oh, well, why wouldn't you remember that? You worked with Shawn Michaels in his rookie year." Well, that's the problem: is nobody knew that this fucking guy that nobody had ever heard of was going to be you know, one of the biggest stars in the business in 10 years or whatever. So, but the reason I remember it is because we could see he was going to be something. Um, I, it was Shawn Michaels and Brickhouse Brown, and it was just a match for us, an underneath match. We were, we were finished with the Fantastics program, but we were going to come back to Baton Rouge in 
either at the next show or the following one and do the scaffold match with the Rock and Roll Express because we were on our way out of the territory. So it just so happened timing wise, this was just a match, a preliminary match for the Midnight Express to win in between those two things. <clears throat> and with the Brickhouse and, and Michaels, Dundee came in and, and all I remember, because we knew automatically he was one of Jose's guys, is all I remember is that Dundee said, hey, you know, the, uh, this kid, uh, Jose's trained him over in Texas, so give him a couple of spots, don't just eat him up. And that was it, right? But when we go out for the match, Bobby gets in with him, and he does a couple things, maybe hip toss, arm drag spot, or whatever, and then I saw... Michaels grabs a headlock and they're taking a little extra time. And then they start rip roaring And Bobby liked to call spots with guys that could do spots. That's why every time we had George South on TV and in, in, in the TBS days, they came up with like a eight or nine phase high spot just to fucking do it. And Bobby started calling stuff for Michaels. And he even got in the run up the buckle and flip off the top rope that y you saw a tape of one of those in, in the biography special. He was doing that as a young baby face when he, you know, he was, he's still brand new, but he was nailing it perfectly. So the point is Bobby called extra stuff with him on the fly because it wasn't that he, Bobby was impressed because he could do a backflip off the top and land on his feet. He was impressed by the way that he could do arm drags and grab a fucking headlock without hurting you. And his feet were in the right place. And if you shot him off, he went, or if he reversed it, he did it, it, it. He was just doing everything right. So that's why Bobby sat down with him for a second and said, what else can you do or whatever? I can do a backflip. Okay. And he worked it into a spot. But that's, I guess, what is that? Is that like the wrestling equivalent of if you were a stand-up comic on the, on the Tonight Show, Carson called you over to the desk after your routine where Bobby Eaton would call extra stuff with you because he could see you had it. So. And then after the match, you know, we were, Dennis and I were also saying, ah, that kid's going to be something. You could tell even then, you didn't know he was going to be the biggest star in the business, but you could tell he was going to be a very good worker just because he was a natural. Um, and I loved also one of the Mid South TV matches they showed at the Irish McNeil. It was Michaels against Buddy Landell, and, and Michaels was arm dragging Buddy. And. I don't know if it was that match or if it was one in a house show or whatever, but Buddy rubbed, Sean rubbed Buddy the wrong way and Buddy took Sean down and rubbed him a little bit the wrong way himself. And then that was 1984. So in 1995, when they're wrestling in Knoxville at the Super Bowl for the Intercontinental title, that was the story behind. Michaels' promo where he said, you know, Buddy Landell, I knew you when I was a nobody and you were a somebody. But now, you may be somebody in Knoxville, but I'm oh so much of a somebody or something like that. He was reminding him, hey, you fucking jacked me around. <laughs> and even though he was professional in the match, he wanted Buddy to know that he still remembered it. So that may have been that match or one they had in one of the houses. but. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I I know when the, when he got the spot in Kansas City and met Marty Jannetty there, we barely missed actually having probably one of the first matches with the Rockers, now that I think about it, because when they booked us in Kansas City in May of 85, the Midnight Express went in to work with Marty Jannetty and Bulldog Bob Brown, because that's when Bob Brown, who was the booker and the top baby face if you can call him that for so many years was had the young kid that could do everything Janetti is his partner but if we if they'd have booked us a month or two later maybe we'd have got to work with the rockers and that match would have actually happened that would have been interesting anyway um they were a great tag team him and Janetti and Janetti had experience at that point so I think even though Janetti may have been the guy that was kind of leading him in the in the ring. He may have been the one that corrupted him in the locker room. And I can't believe they didn't show more of that Rose and Summers match. That was the the big fucking thing. And part of it was because the AWA was gasping even at that point. That it was on its last legs and it had lost a lot of the talent. But 
the rockers and rose and summers were fucking tearing the houses down what was left of them and that tv match was one of the big matches of the year was it not well you may have been a little young but you got tapes shortly afterwards when you started trading tapes that was a big deal match it was it was a match that everyone talked about for years and when they finally put it in perfect quality on one of the Shawn michaels dvds that was a big moment for a lot of people but certainly one of the big Try to think of anything else from 86 in the AWA that really stands out. I mean, it's really that match. Well, yeah. well that's not fair. Kurt Hennig and uh, Nick Bockwinkle, but... Yes, that was 86, too. So, and, and, of course, Buddy Rose was tremendous, but Doug Summers was a great worker. It's just his, his look was so completely bland, right, that it, it was hard for him to find a top spot, and he got it there. But any, they, they danced around the... The Rockers' first trip to the WWF in 1987 where they got fired the first night after the deal in the bar, but Michaels was like, well, it was all blown up out of proportion. What was it? Do you remember what they actually did, or was it just the overall presentation that they made in the bar that night? I don't remember, but whatever it was, I don't remember being... Oh, we didn't really do anything. It was just the stories got out of hand. And yeah, Vince, no, no. It Vince was, had to react to the stories. I it, it, No, it did not happen that they brought a team in that they were going to push on television and fired them after one night because of stories that people told about what they did in the bar. But anyway, um, it, I'm sure Ron Fuller was was thrilled over the the uh, statement from Michaels that in Continental, if you wanted, you could get your 100 in cash or you could get 50 cash and 50 in blow. Um, although it, it, Michaels was pretty honest about the fact that he took almost every drug you could conceivably take for a long period of time there. Yeah, just when you look at him and you think, oh, you know, he looks like he's had it rough. Then they show Genetti. Yeah, he's yeah. missing a tooth, and he just looks like a mess. Um, I love Taker said that when they came back to the WWF, there were still a couple of pecker heads. Uh, the Hart Foundation match, the Phantom title change, that was a big deal at the time. Also, in the newsletters and amongst the small, smart fan population of the time there, because that was the first time in the history of any major promotion, there had been phantom title changes in the territories all the time when some guy left with no notice or whatever the fuck, and you said, well, so-and-so beat him in Bluefield, West Virginia, and then that match never happened. But this was the first time that a major promotion had ever actually, on purpose, switched its a championship and then just said, you know what, never mind. We're just not going to act like that happened. Can you think of another one? There must be an example somewhere. I can't think of it. And again, I'm just because their plans that, really changed because they were about to, I think, let Neidhart go. And after they decided not to air the footage and to put the belts back on the Hart Foundation, it saved his job, I think. Yeah, but also there had to be something else going on in Vince's mind at that time besides, well, the rope broke and it was a shitty match because then they could have redone it at some point. But I think afterwards, Vince, as he was wont to do sometimes, just say, you know what? No, I'm, I'm, I'm cold on that whole thing. Let's not do it. But that was, for the smart fans, that was shocking at the time. I know the way it, it is now, the people can't understand this, but a lot of the fans that heard about the match even though it wasn't shown on television, we're like, well, that's bullshit. They won the belts. The belts changed hands. It was at a show in front of people. They're ruining the the integrity of the championship. That was a big deal, not just amongst people in the business, but the fans thought that because the early smart fans actually took up more for the traditions and rules and parameters of the wrestling business than the promoters, whereas now it's completely, well, nobody gives a shit, but the smart fans now don't give a fuck about whether anything's credible or meaningful or whatever, whereas before they were the guardians of the integrity of wrestling. And I don't remember 
Maybe somebody else out there can can bring it up. I don't remember another company ever, a major promotion, changing the title in front of people and then just saying, no, nope, never mind, we're not going to show it. It didn't happen. And, uh, you know, Vince pretty much started that. Vince started the let's retake the move when they got big time television production behind them and people who knew television. They were telling us this when I went up there in 93. If you fuck up a move, don't worry. We'll edit it out. Just go back to the same place that you started and do the move over again. And I was fucking mortified. I said, what about the fucking people in the building? Well, no, we'll edit it out before it shows on TV. I said, there's 10,000 people in a fucking building. And most of the guys would ignore it. And if they, if something did screw up, they would work around to the same place and they'd do something different that started out like their fuck up or from the same place as their fuck up. But some of the newer guys just started taking that advice and doing it. And that's why they do it today. Because the, the TV people started telling them to. Just fucking lunacy. Anyway, um, the breakup with Marty, I hadn't seen Marty go head first through the barbershop window in a while. So that was, but there he becomes, you know, the, the uh, second fiddle and the heartbreak kid takes off. And the, the WrestleMania 10 ladder match was phenomenal. I was there live. I came back, stole it for Smoky Mountain, came back talking about it. Um, I think Flair has referred to it as the night that Shawn Michaels had a match with a ladder and Razor Ramon was there. But that really did elevate him because, and at the time, again, nobody'd seen the ladder match and there was only one ladder. He even, Michaels even mentioned that. By the way, but, they interspersed this whole thing with Michael sitting down watching tapes with people in NXT, coaching at NXT at ringside. If he's doing all this, why aren't the guys in NXT a lot better than they are? Is anybody listening? But anyway, he mentioned, well, we only had one ladder back then. Yeah, the way it's supposed to be before it got fucking stupid. And, and just a fucking stunt show they told a story with a ladder and trying to get a prize instead of hey let's build all these fucking erector set projects like we're in shop class so we can jump through them uh now was it six marines or nine marines brian because at first they said six but then i think triple h's talking head comment was was nine i thought they I, said, I thought they said six well, they said six at first, but then somebody later followed. It was either my, no, it was a clip of Michael's where he said, yeah, I got beat up by nine more. Cause they were telling nine at the start. Remember when it first happened, the story was nine of them. And then it, it was down to six. Cause I guess, they, well, nine's a little crowded. It was one. Michael's was drunk. We've told the story. They pulled him out of the car when he was already sitting down. He didn't know what was going on. I'm not saying he would have beat the guy, but he didn't have a chance. And Davey, who could have saved the day, was stuck in the back seat of a two-door car. But it's six for A&E's purposes. Um, Vince McMahon's sound bites have not added a lot of perceptive insight into any of this. Do you, if, if, do you feel like it's just like he knew they they wanted him and had to have him, and he was giving them as little time as possible and didn't get the fuck out of my office? I think Vince's memory is completely shot and there's very little that he could add to something like this, a documentary like this, that is really valuable. I don't think he remembers shit. <laughs> uh, they had the guy on who shot the video of the curtain call in Madison square garden and showed the footage there. We'll never get rid of that shit. I would like to meet the guy who shot it and then spread it around so that I could slap him in a fucking face, tell him what a piece of shit he Whoa, is. No, it's not his fault they did it. It's not his fault he they did it. It's his fault that people outside Madison Square Garden have seen it. Well, if it makes you feel better, it seems like even he doesn't have a good quality copy of it based on well, what no. they're hearing the thing. Um, and you know, the other thing, like, too, is they always talk about it, and I knew they were going to do it here, that... The curtain call happens, and 
Vince couldn't punish Kevin or Scott because they were leaving. And he couldn't punish Sean Waltman because he wasn't even there. And he couldn't punish Shawn Michaels because he's the champion. The only one he could punish was Triple H. Another way of looking at it was Triple H was the only one out of all those guys who was sober. He's the only one who should have known better. He's the only one who should have known better. <laughs> because Well, and that was the thing is that I, when he went around, when Triple H went around apologizing to everybody as he was instructed to by the office as part of his penance, um, I said, did, how did you not see that? That they can't do anything to those two. They left. And Sean's got the belt. So there you are. And he, you know, and of course, as we've since mentioned, he didn't mean the apology. He just was biding his time until he got enough pull to fucking go, oh, look what we did. And that's the thing. Triple H sat there and said, this had never been done before. And the people were going insane. No, they weren't. I was there. They were going, what the fuck's going on? Because it was Madison Square Garden, not a fucking fan fest of observer readers. Even, even then, even in New York, out of the 18,000 people in that arena, Brian, how many people would have been reading the Wrestling Observer in 1996? Even in New York. Do I say a few hundred or is that too high? I don't know, but... I, d I don't know. It, it, a hundred? It, but if it was a thousand, a thousand people out of 18,000 is still is not going insane because they were going, what the fuck? Because, they, well, they're the guy that they were just fighting and now they're up and they're hugging and here's... The other guy, well, he's a, he's a good guy and he's a bad, what the fuck? They did it for themselves to show that they could and to stroke their own egos. And they shit on the wrestling business in the most famous arena in the world, which was like Vince McMahon's dining room table to show that they could. And then at least they put in Flair's comment. If they'd have done that in other places, some years previously, they would have all four gotten their asses kicked, which they would have but there weren't enough responsible people in the WWF at that point in time to do that. Um, Jerry Briscoe wanted to. Jerry Briscoe set a shot put record. He had his, his satchel bag with him, and he fucking launched that thing down those long Madison Square Garden aisleways, or not aisle, hallways back in the locker room area. He launched one. He was fucking hot. He wanted to stretch the bunch of them. I just walked away and tried to figure out how the fuck we could get out of Madison Square Garden as quickly as possible. Anyway, um, great stories on Triple H playing babysitter while Shawn Michaels had a mental and drug-induced breakdown over not being able to handle the fucking pressure that Bret Hart knew he wouldn't be able to handle, which is why Bret dropped the belt to him and then took the year off to go make Lonesome Dove so that he could come back and save the company when Michael's self-destructed and cracked up mentally and overdosed, which he did all of those things. Um, he claimed his lost smile was because of the torn ACL. And that's the first time that I've heard that the ACL was all the way torn because when he came back, uh, from that career-ending injury, what, about six weeks later, I've heard it was just a either a partial tear or some cartilage, or we can handle this with some physical therapy. He didn't want to drop the belt at WrestleMania to Brett. But because he's still alive, they had to fucking put doubt on that and make his lost smile comment somewhat, you know, reasonable, or the reason behind it somewhat legitimate. It wasn't. He didn't have a career-ending injury, and he certainly wasn't hurt so bad that if he did have a career-ending injury, he couldn't wrestle one more match to drop that title. No, I can't wrestle ever again, because one doctor said I got a bad knee. So I'll sit out for six weeks till I don't have to drop the title anymore, and suddenly my I can just wrestle just fine. Um... Then they glorified DX by talking about how cutting edge they were and how they went and assed off on television. I always thought that they were embarrassing and they were jacking off on Vince's national television show that he was paying for. And I didn't see why he put up with all of that shit. Um, 
Montreal suddenly now Vince is the heel and Michaels was the innocent, gutsy employee, according to Bruce Pritchard, doing what he was asked and risking his reputation to do it. Plus the usual bullshit, and it was The Undertaker this time. We yeah. had to do this because Brett could have showed up on Nitro the next night with the belt. No, he couldn't have. No, he couldn't have. And nobody thought, and Vince didn't think he was going to do that either because he knew that that was not a possibility. He was not going to show up with the belt. The whole bone of contention was not, and I will repeat this again, was not that nobody trusted Brett. It's that nobody trusted Eric Bischoff. And why would you trust Eric Bischoff? The definition of a game show host con man. And the thought was, and the fear was, that if Brett retained that weekend, the next time that WCW was on live television would be the following Monday, where even if Brett couldn't appear or be on with the, t with the championship belt, the only thing that Vince had was Eric Bischoff's word that he would not announce that we have just signed, ladies and gentlemen, and he will be appearing for WCW very shortly, the current reigning. WWF champion, Brett the Hitman Hart. And there wouldn't have really been anything illegally they could have done about that if he had it. So I know that people now go, well, what difference does it mean? It's just a wrestling belt. No, it was your goddamn world champion. Back when a time where such things were rightfully considered sacred and no way was anybody in that company going to let Eric Bischoff be able to say that he had signed the WWF champion? The guy that just lost the belt? Fine. Not the champion. And that's where that whole thing hit the wall. Anyway, the casket bump. Did you see the Royal Rumble casket bump? Of course. He didn't even sell it at the time. Did you see it? I was about to say. <laughs> well, such as it was, this has been the modern day Dory Funk Jr. truck wreck on the ranch. And you know where I've always fucking, the side I've always come down on. Yes, I believe that Shawn Michaels could have had a bad back. I believe that every wrestler in the business has a bad back or somebody could make the case that they've got a bad back if the, they want that case to be made. And I'm, Sure also that he had surgery. And I'm sure also that that everybody that, that's seen it has said that the incision was about an inch and a half long, and that's about the same incision that Stacy had when she had her back surgery last month. And I'm sorry, I don't buy that Shawn Michaels, after all the other shit that he's pulled, or had pulled at that point in time, takes a nearly phantom bump, finishes a match, complains about his back, puts doubt in Vince and everybody else's mind that he's going to show up and do the right thing at that year's WrestleMania, drop the belt to Austin. Uh, and then with all the things that they didn't go into that he did to raise that confusion having to stay at a different hotel, refusing to come to the fucking building until such and such a time, and then on his own fucking terms. Uh, if so-and-so's around, then I've got to have protection, and I don't want to be around anybody, and, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And then, after that, he's still under contract, but he takes time off to have back surgery. And that back surgery in 1998 ends his in-ring career for three years until there is no other competition for Vince McMahon. WCW goes out of business. At that point, Michaels' contract is up, and it's not going to be renewed because now Vince doesn't have to pay Shawn Michaels to not go to WCW because there is no WCW. Suddenly, Shawn Michaels can wrestle again. It's amazing how this shit works out. Anyway, 
So after WrestleMania, he has the back surgery. He falls in love with a Nitro girl on television. One of those heartwarming Andy Hardy type stories. That's my favorite. That's the most Prince-like story in the whole thing. Just watching Nitro. I'll have her. <laughs> Tell her to come to San Antonio. Tell her to come to me. Um, And it, there was a nice baby face speech in this by Sean over he, he hit rock bottom. And apparently, who would have known his wife, the Nitro girl, is the started the religious thing. And he became addicted to religion to replace the drugs. And, of course, they don't talk to the world-class spinal surgeon that put his back back in shape and ended his career-ending injury. They don't talk to him. His wife says a miracle is what it was, that his back was healed. A miracle or not getting paid anymore. Um... He came back, the flair match. Now he's a teacher and a mentor. And once again, the redemption story at the end, it almost, it made me even madder, I think, at the end at Shawn Michaels because I worked with him there, coexisted for five years. And if he hadn't been such a raven fucking asshole, a piece of shit, a prick, an unreliable fucking pillhead, then I could have said all kinds of wonderful things about him as the greatest in-ring talent of his particular decade. So it makes me more mad at the end at Shawn Michaels that he had to set that fucking standard for himself so that I would not ever give him a chance to be this sunny Christian mentor that he's now become. <sighs> Michael Cole. Or not Michael Cole, but Adam <laughs> Cole. There's so many Coles. No, Adam Cole said at the end of it, he described Shawn Michaels as kind, generous, and humble. He may be now. And I bet all the guys who know him now love him. But I promise you, if you had come into a fucking room at Vince's house or at the Titan Tower or at any arena and there was Vince McMahon and Bruce Pritchard and me and Jim Ross and fucking any of the agents Jack Lanza and fucking any, anybody anybody involved in the in the company in the, at the time of the 90s and you said boy Shawn Michaels is kind generous and humble they would have drug tested you. Jack Lanza would have laughed. We would have all blown snot laughing. They would have drug tested the person that said that. Can a leopard really change his spots, Brian? What do you think? I don't know. I mean, it was weird seeing this. He seemed like a different guy. He was talking about his past self like he understands a lot of his problems. I was surprised how open he was about cocaine talk. Yeah, he admitted all of, well, not all, you couldn't, he, there, it was only a two-hour program. He couldn't have admitted all the drugs he took, but he admitted a lot of the shit he did. But it just seems like, and, and here's the thing, next to fucking Shawn Michaels in his prime, Randy Savage was a model employee. He was He was somebody you could count on to do right by the business. There was... It, it, and he gets slandered because he's gone. But meanwhile, everybody else is still around, no matter what they've done in the past. It ends up with a positive outlook. Randy Savage's biography ends with some fucking ex-girlfriend stripper talking about his goddamn surveillance cameras. But Shawn Michaels, of all people, ends up being kind, generous, and humble like shoeshine boy. Well, that was the biography of Shawn Michaels. <laughs> Perhaps you're someone who cares the about history. The world has turned upside down. Perhaps you're someone who Shawn Michaels has offended or bothered in the past, and you watch that, and you don't know what to think about things today. Perhaps you regret thinking about suing Shawn Michaels in the past, and you want to just forgive and forget. Perhaps you regret starting into that segue. <laughs> What do you mean, perhaps? Perhaps we could just get to the bottom of the matter and tell the people that there's only one man 
one man that you should call if you need help in a legal arena, or one man that you should call if you need tickets to a big event in Beckley in August. It's all the same man. It's all this man. Call Stephen P. What's the What the hell is that? If you to the to the to the to the to the <laughs> I want to yes. give credit to Rocky the remote, but that, of course, was Lior. Lior, <laughs> Lior has covered. Uh. <laughs> he didn't tell me either. Oh, he will sue your ass, folks. If you need someone's ass sued for plagiarism of another copyrighted musical work or whatever the cost may be. Uh, call Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. We have mentioned so many of the the cases and the class action suits and the group representations, all the things that Stephen P. New has been involved in with cancer-causing agents and Minden, West Virginia being left in the ground with the talcum powder cases, the Roundup cases, but most recently, incredible Incredible news on the earplugs, the defective earplugs that our service members were given by the 3M Corporation that caused their hearing loss and hearing damage. The first few of those cases have gone to trial and have resulted in million, multi-million dollar judgments. And Stephen's got a bunch of those coming up. And if you want to get in on that because you or a member of your family have been victimized by this, we've gotten several. I think almost a couple of dozen now, members of the cult of Cornette who have referred members of their family or their social circle to Stephen P. New. If you know someone, if you uh, have a member of your family or a close friend or even an acquaintance if, that you want to help out that has been damaged in some way by these cases that you're hearing about on television on a regular basis, Stephen P. News, the man for you, 888-692-8084. Get even with Stephen at newlawoffice.com. And the big Raleigh County Armory, Beckley Bash, the Bash in Beckley, this coming August. Jerry the King Lawler is going to be there. A bunch more things. It's an all-star wrestling promotion with the official sponsorship of New Law Office, and they're going to they're gonna have a big crowd in Beckley, something that I could never accomplish. Despite all my other accomplishments, Brian, as a promoter, I couldn't get the crowd in Beckley. Steven's going to, I didn't have Steven back then. If I had him, he would only been eight years old anyway. So there you go. Steven P. New. Yes, that's the one I'm talking about.